Our next speaker is Bruno Santos, um, who is at USP. Uh, he will talk about Bayesian quantile regression analysis for continuous data with a discrete component at zero. Thank you for the introduction and also the uh, scientific committee for selecting our work to be presented here. So uh, I'm going to talk about quantile regression models, which Professor Migon talked about yesterday. So, uh, but I'm more interested in data, continuous data with the discrete component at zero. So uh, the way my talk is organized, I'm going to start with some motivation about uh, what kind of data I'm, I'm interested in. And then I'm going to briefly just talk about this two-part model, which is the, the basis of our model. Uh, in the third part of, our, of, of the talk, I'm going to show our contribution where we try to analyze this discrete component at zero in using two assumptions that are usually used in two different models in the econometrics literature. And uh, I'm going to give you two applications of, the, our, of our model with some interesting results and just finish with some remarks. So uh, the data that I'm, um, I'm going to going to be analyzing is data like this. Uh, there are positive value distributions uh, where there is a point mass distribution at zero. So if you look at, for instance, expenditures with durable goods in Brazil, and this survey was collected in 2008 and 2009. So in this period, it's possible that part of the households, they didn't have any expenditures. So you will see this point mass distribution at zero. Uh, so what we, we want to do is uh, try to, to get as much information as we can uh, using quantile regression. So uh, two possible models that you can use in this data um, are the Tobit model and the two-part model. Uh, the Tobit model was proposed by James Tobin in 1958, and it's interesting that he, he was actually thinking about this same type of data. He was looking at exp expenditures with durable goods, and he assumed that if you want to build some type of regression setting uh, where you want to study how some covariates, they are associated with these expenditures, you have to consider those zero observation as censored observation. So uh, somehow, if you consider that the observation were generated, for example, by a normal distribution, we will have to use the cumulative, cumulative distribution, distributive function to in the likelihood calculation, for instance. And later, in 1971, uh, Craig proposed a different model um, looking at this exactly the same type of data. And he thought of, um, when you look at this data as expenditures, first the person would decide whether they would buy this durable good or not, and then if they decide to buy, you can analyze um, the information on how much they are going to spend with this durable good. So it's um, very interesting that these two models, uh, they look at the same type of data and they use a very, very different assumptions on, on how to model this data. And today, um, what we propose here is, uh, what if those two assumptions are actually valid? So what if we can consider part of the zeros censored and part of the zeros are true zeros? So um, that's what we're going to do. And uh, instead of just looking for the conditional mean, we are interested in looking at quantile regression. So we are interested in, in studying the conditional quantiles because we believe that we are able to get more information about the condition distribution. Uh, so just a quick review about this two-part model. Um, if you want to model your data with this, with, this, with this type of model, you can write your density um, in the following way. You will have a a p, which is the probability of your response variable being equal to zero, and the one minus p that is going to be greater than zero. And you're going to assume some uh, density for to model the positive values. 
And you can add some covariates to model the probability through a link functions, for instance, the logistic function. And you can, if you assume some distribution for the positive part, you can make inference, for instance, about the conditional mean of the, this positive part. So this is what he did in 1971. Um, we're going to start with something similar, just because we are interested in, in looking at the quantiles of this distribution, we're going to propose using in that f function uh, the asymmetric Laplace, as Miguel already mentioned yesterday. So just a quick review about distribution. This is its density function. And the nice thing about distribution is, and it's wide, it's used widely in the, for estimating Bayesian quantile regressions is that its location parameters, it's equal to the tauth quantile of the response variable. So um, if, you, if you consider then distribution in the likelihood, it's shown, it's proved in the literature that uh, a good approximation for the, the quantiles of your response even when the, your response doesn't follow distribution. So, and a nice, a nice thing about distribution is that you can use a mixture representation um, where a condition on a exponential distribution, uh, exponential, exponentially latent variable with mean sigma, you can actually use a normal distribution in your, in your likelihood. So condition on this latent variable V your response variable y is going to follow a normal distribution, which will make very easy to, to propose uh, Gibbs sampling, for instance. So we can write down the full model like this. We've defined the sets j and k, uh, j for the zero observations and k for the, the positive values of observations. Um, here, just a detail that we're going to use uh, H function to actually transform the data to, so we can match the support of the asymmetric Laplace distribution in the response. Um, and in the, for the priors, we're going to use a normal prior for beta tau and, and gamma. And for sigma, we're going to consider an inverse gamma distribution in the prior. So if you do the math, you're going to find this full condition distribution for this parameter. So you find the beta is a normal distribution. It, VI, is the, the latent variable, follows a generalized inverse Gaussian. Sigma is inverse gamma. In gamma, you can uh, use, for instance, um, a metropolis hastens algorithm to draw samples for the procedure. And here we're going to really change a little bit this model to consider that the, those zero observations there, they, they can be actually censored or be part of this point mass distribution. So uh, we're going to do a um, small change in the density, actually um, just adding up that 1 minus p times the f at zero. And the, th the, the problem is that you don't you don't observe is, is if the observation is censored or not. So you have to add another latent variable to study that. So we add that variable, which we call here C, which will help us to, to model this, this probability of being censored. And it's easy to find that the probability of, if you say that C equals to 1 when Y is censored, um, that will be the probability of C equal to a condition on Y being equal to zero. And with that, we are able to update this variable in, in, our, in our AMCMC. And we've, if we have that information, if we have that the, the variable is censored or not, we can actually go back to the two-part model. The only next thing that we need to do is use a um, common method when we have these Tobit models uh, even the Tobit quantile regression, you can use this, this method to replace your centered observations for, for instance, here, because your Y, you're believing that it's normal, you can, you can use the truncated normal to replace your observation given your model parameters like beta, tau, sigma, and your latent variable. So uh, I'm going to show you now some interesting results that 
uh, we found. Just one more thing about here is that the interesting here, one interesting th thing here is that this probability of being censored depends on the quantile that you're studying. So we believe that with, with that specification, you get more information when you're studying these zero observations. So the first application is a well-known data set in the econometrics literature. And it's about labor supply data in Great Britain. And in, it was first published by Mraz in 1987. And in this data set, we'll find 753 married women. They are aged between 30 and 60. And between those women, those women 30, uh, 325 did not work that year in 1975. So the response variable here is the number of hours worked during that year. And we are interested in, in trying to see the association of, the, of those number of hours worked with some covariates for, for example, non-wife income, years of education, years of experience, age, number of kids younger, younger than six and between six and 18. Uh, so what we, we did here was just propose a logistic model to model probability and um, a linear model to model the, the, the conditional quantiles. Uh, so, uh, first um, result that we, we, we can show here is that if you look at the density of the, if we get all those zero observations and get the probability of being censored after we, we updated our MC, MC a number of times, we're going to get this density for the, the, the probability of being censored for, for those zero observations. So, what we see is that for the quantile point one, this probability is more concentrated closer to zero. So if you, if you are looking at the, the number of hours worked for those women, uh, and we are looking at the quantile point one, we are going to say that for those women who worked less hours, and if you compare the, the woman with zero hours, they are more likely to be what we say true zeros, that in some way they didn't want to be part of the workforce. On the other hand, if you look at the, the point 0.9 quantile and we, when, and we update our model, we're going to see a more spread distribution between 0 and 1. Another interesting result is that, uh, as I said before, the, this probability of being censored, it, 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 and we saw in the, the previous plot, it varies with quantile. So if you look at the distribution of non-wife income, in two different quantiles, the point 0.1 in the left and point 0.5 in the right. In the point 0.1, uh, if we separate those women who worked zero hours, and we look at the, and we, and we create two groups, the group with the greater, greater than average probability and then the, the group with the smaller than average, we can say there, is, there isn't any difference between, there isn't any difference between those two groups. But if you look at the, the median quantile, then the distribution of women who have smaller than average probability, they, they seem to have like a, a greater non-wife income, which makes sense that uh, somehow it will say that th those women are, are more inclined to, to do not work if they have more income that they can help us somehow. So the second example is the expenditures with durable goods, which I showed you earlier. So this uh, survey was collected between 2008 and 2009. And it's a national survey that interviewed more than 50,000 households. Um, just to, due to computational uh, difficulties, we, we're going to use just the, the data from the state of Marignan. And in this data, we have more than 2,000 observations and a uh, little more than 1,000 where uh, those families didn't spend anything with the durable goods in that period. And we're going to use as covariates the gender race, if the person had a credit card or not, age and years of education. So here's the data again. And uh, when we think about quantile regression, this is probably one of the first plots that come to mind. Because if you assume that, and, and you fit that model that, you're going to you try to estimate the, those quantile regression parameters for different quantiles. You're more interested when those estimates, they are different 
for each quantile, for, for example. So if you see education on the top right, you see that the estimate of the model grows when you, you, you increase the quantile. And you, you're also going to see that sometimes those estimates are just significant on just a few quantiles. So that's also very interesting. So for example, gender here in the right and the bottom left is just given the credible intervals we're going to say we would going to say that it's significant on only on the point nine quantile and despite the credit card there in the middle and the top not being significant in any quantile it's very interesting when we analyze the probability of being censored so if we plot here the the density of this those probabilities in the medium model we're going to see a very different distribution. Uh, so the solid line, the group with the credit card, we can see that they have a much larger probability of being censored than the, the group with other credit cards. So we can interpret that as this group with the credit card, they, have a, they are more likely to make this purchase and with the durable goods, but for some reason they did not uh, buy anything. And we can actually look at, the, at, at those probabilities for all the quantiles that we are studying. So here, we can create these profiles of these probabilities for all the observations, the zero observations. And we're going to see if we compare the, the group with the credit card with the group without a credit card that they have uh, quite easily the greater probability of being censored. So in this way, we are making um, some kind of differentiation about this, this zero observation, saying that they are not all equal. So uh, just to wrap up in this work, so we're trying to use different assumptions, these two different assumptions to model the zero data. And we believe that it's in interesting to use these quantile regression models to, to get more information and also to be more flexible when we actually analyzing this data because as we saw this probability of being censored it depends on the quantile so an observation can have a, a small probability of being censored for a low quantile but a, maybe a greater probability of being censored for a larger quantile so that's it. thank you Bruno, uh, have you thought about um, compare your model, for instance, for the 0.5 uh, quantile and the standard uh, Tobit model for prediction, for instance, using some score function or scoring rule or something? Well, I have not, but um, when you think about quantile regression, it's actually not common to see being used as a prediction model. So, I mean, I could make that, that comparison, but I don't know how much valuable that would be. But uh, I, I definitely could do, could do that comparison. Okay, thank you. Another question? Why did you say you don't use this for a prediction? Why it's not um, very easy? Because um, you're, per, I mean, you're estimating these effects on different quantiles. So usually when you're trying to predict, you're trying to predict just one point. So you could, you could try to combine those estimates of those, all those quantiles. You could actually try to pick the best quantile to, to, to make a prediction, but this is not often the case. But uh, usually these models are more used as an exploratory tool to try to understand this, this, this behavior if you see like a different effect in different quantiles, but you could always use as prediction, but it's not the common, just that. 